Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Luke. The Gospel Record of Luke in chapter number 5. The Gospel Record of Luke in chapter number 5. Now, as we're going through this wonderful gospel record, we understand that this gospel record takes its time and it gives us lots of details about the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it paints a picture. And one of the things that we're going to run into from time to time is that as we try to take these in small segments and try to hit the stories, sometimes we will get the stories and maybe miss the rest of the context. We have to understand that there's a whole context of things going on. For example, this morning we had spoken about how the Pharisees had traveled from different countries even, came from the cities and whatnot. They had gathered for the purpose of criticizing the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this morning we had taken the event that they were in a house and the four men broke through the roof to deliver their man, their friend sick with a palsy in front of Jesus. And we saw it and saw the reaction of it. However, the Pharisees are still here as we pick the the account up in the Luke gospel record of Luke chapter 5, the gospel record of Luke chapter 5 and starting at verse 27, I want you to keep in mind that the Pharisees are still here for the purpose of finding something wrong with Jesus to find some way to criticize him. And so as we find the gospel record of Luke chapter number 5, notice with me if you wouldn't mind in verse number 27. The gospel record of Luke chapter 5 and verse 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house of publicans and of others that sat down with him. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, then, and then shall they fast. In those days. And he spake also a parable unto them No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that is taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles. And both are preserved. No man having also having drunk old wine straight away desireth the new, for he said, The old is better. And if you're in the habit of marking things, there are two things I want you to put your attention on as Jesus Christ is being condemned. And notice with me, if you don't mind, the gospel record of Luke chapter number five and verse number 30, as we could see this whole thing is centered around these two groups of people here or what they're being criticized. Verse uh, number 30 at the end, publicans and sinners, publicans and sinners. And with the Lord's help, we want to examine as the, the Pharisees have found something to criticize Jesus Christ. And it's all dealing with the subject of the publicans and 
sinners. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you and open up this passage, I'm praying that you would give us great discernment, great understanding, great wisdom, that we can make these things plain. Let them be clearly understood and that we can see what is going on and what you're teaching and how we can apply it to our life. Again, thank you, Lord that we could be on your side. Fill me with your spirit now and that you could do a work. In Jesus' name, amen. Now as we approach this, I want to again emphasize here the context. The Pharisees have gathered from far and wide. Can you imagine having your life so open like a fishbowl that they are studying your life? They're beating the hedges, trying to see if they could get some kind of game to scurry out. That they could say, there it is, there it is. They're doing everything they can to counter Jesus, to get in Jesus' face. Eventually, they're going to start just yelling at Jesus to try to provoke him to have a wrong reaction. How would you like to have your life where everything you do is examined, criticized, and filtered? That's the type of life that Jesus is living. He's living a life where everyone follows him. He's got people that want to learn from him and people that want to criticize him. No matter what he does, he's going to be criticized. If we could be honest about the world that we live on, the world that we live in today is wimpy. They cannot stand any kind of criticism. And if we're not careful, what happens is that as we as Christians start to adapt to that same line of thinking of our society and we get to the place where little criticisms can break our little hearts. Little criticisms can break our whole world. It could devastate us. Well again, I want you to think about Jesus Christ who people are with pen and paper examining his life, expecting, looking, and trying to even manufacture some type of way they can criticize him. How does he respond? Does he yell at him? Does he cry? Does he leave me alone, guys? Stop picking on me. How does he respond? Well, we're going to see his response inside of this thing as he's criticized, dealing with the subject of publicans and sinners. Notice with me, if you don't mind, as we examine this, we see that Christ came for the sick. Christ came for the sick. As we pick it up in verse number 27, may we also remind you in the context, Jesus is starting to call out his 12. The gospel record of Luke gives us a little bit more details. Now remember, he came to a couple fishers and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And from there you had Peter, James, John, and Andrew quit their fishing business and they begin to follow after Christ. Now we can see that once again Jesus Christ is calling someone who's going to be another disciple. Notice with me if you don't mind in verse number 27. And after these things he, that's Jesus, went forth and saw a publican. When we come here, let's go ahead and define our terms. What is a publican? A publican is a Jewish person, a Hebrew person, who collaborates with the Roman government. Now, at this time, the Jewish people hated the Roman government. They just absolutely hated them. But remember that Rome never conquered Israel. Israel was pretty much sold out. Someone who was not a Hebrew person said, hey, you want to buy a country? I'll sell it to you. Sure, we'll buy it. And the Romans came in and said, hey, we bought you. You guys are part of our our empire now. Congratulations. And the Jewish people are not happy. I mean, it's one thing you lose a war. Okay, now we're subject to you. But it's another thing where you didn't lose a war. You just one day were part of this government. And they're upset and they're mad and they hate the Romans. And of course the Roman government has to run off of economy and so they have to raise taxes. And so the publicans are Hebrew people, Jewish people, who work with the Roman government to collect taxes from the rest of the people. We already know that tax collectors are not people's favorite. Even today, if you say tax collector, you're not thinking of your best friend. It's just something with the idea. The guy who's taking money from me. When you look at your paycheck, and we know that the tax collector usually comes through taking it out of your paycheck before you get it now. You look at it, and you're not happy with it. My kids are now beginning to work, and one of them got a paycheck the other day. It was like, where did it all go? 
Well, the tax collector came. And at that time, the tax collector was not my kid's best friend. Well, sorry, get used to it. The tax collector is just not the person you like because they're taking your money. Now, on top of that, the tax collectors were allowed to take as much as they can get away with as long as Rome got their money and they did not provoke a riot. So, do you think some people took advantage of that? They took advantage of their own people in the name of taxes and took more from the others. Now, what would happen is that everybody hated the tax collector, so the tax collectors are not be friends. And so being in the flesh, not being saved, they would often say, oh yeah, well they hate me, so I'm going to give them a reason to hate me and get more taxes from them. And so they were not very popular people. And so Jesus decides he's going to go walk into a tax collector's office. Verse 27, and after these things, he, Jesus, went forth and saw a publican, a tax collector named Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom. This means he's sitting at his office. He's sitting at a gov government building, counting the receipts, making sure Rome gets his taxes, and he's putting his side. So one for Rome, one for me, Rome for... So he's sitting in his office. Jesus comes in. Hey, how are you? And he said unto him, Jesus said unto him, follow me. Now, can you imagine this? Now, at this time, you have outside of the window. Now, just use your divine imagination. Let's just imagine it's a storefront. And there's a tax collector. Jesus goes in, hears the little bell, goes in, sees the tax collector. The tax collector is working, looks up. Yes, may I help you? Jesus says, follow me. At this time, outside of the big pane window, just use your divine imagination with me, you have... The Pharisees, pad and paper in hand. He went into a tax collector's office. He's taught, he asked him to follow him? What is he thinking? Does he know how evil that guy is? Does he know that everyone hates him? Doesn't he know that he was working for the enemy? Oh, we're reporting this. We finally got him. He's in a tax collector's office willingly talking with a guy, trying to recruit him to be part of his followers. Notice as it goes on, verse 28, and he, the tax collector, left all, rose up, and followed him. Wow. Once again, Jesus has gone to Fishers, follow me. They left everything. They left their business. They left their father. They left their biggest catch of the day, their biggest uh, profit in all of their business, and walked away that same day. He goes into this publican, a tax collector's office. He's in the middle of working, has money sitting there. Follow me. And he left everything immediately to follow after Jesus. Now, we know this tax collector, Levi, has a different name. We know him as Matthew. And so, he's going to become Matthew, who's going to later write the gospel record of Matthew. It's the same tax collector. He was working in his office when Jesus came in and said, follow me. He left everything. Again, verse 28. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. He quit his business that day, money on the table, to follow after Christ. You'd almost think there's something to this following after Christ thing that actually is a little bit more than just showing up to Sunday morning services. He left everything to follow after Christ. Well, again, the Pharisees, can you believe this? He wants a publican, the evil publicans, to be part of his team. Verse 29, and Levi made him, Jesus, a great feast in his own house. Now, he made a big feast and says, Hey guys, I'm having a retirement party. I'm letting everyone know I'm quitting the tax collecting business and I'm following Jesus. Here's this Jesus. I want everyone to know him. Well, that's kind of interesting. Someone who decides to follow after Jesus wants his friends to know Jesus. I want you to meet the guy that I'm deciding to leave everything and follow after. I want you to see him yourself. Everyone come. Now, let's pause. Who would be the tax collector's friends? Other tax collectors? No one else wants to hang out with them. The only people that's going to hang out with a hated people society is other people that are hated in society. And so guess who's going to show up to the party? Other than the Pharisees who have their pads and paper and recording everything that's happening. 
Notice with me in verse 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with him. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured. That means complained, gossiped. Now notice who they're complaining and gossiping to. They complained and gossiped to the disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? May we pause here? Them dirty dogs. Who are they after? Jesus. So who are they going to go a- uh, after? Not Jesus. His disciples. Now remember, Jesus' disciples are Hebrews just like everyone else. Do you think that when Peter, James, and John, and Andrew were running their fishing business that they were really favorable to tax collectors? Probably not. Especially if they were religious Jews. They try to do what's right. They, they try to they listen to John the Baptist. They try to do all of those things. They try to do what's right. And so because it's a sore spot, because it's something that's different... Here, the um, Pharisees come to Peter and James and John and Andrew, the ones that we know are already following him. Hey, why is your boss hanging out at this place? Hanging out with sinners. Hanging out with publicans. Do you know over there, that's a harlot. Your master's hanging out with a harlot. You see that guy, he's cheated everyone in the neighborhood. That's who you guys are hanging out with? You left your fishing business (laughs) to go hang out with sinners and publicans. Now at this time, probably knowing the disciples that they weren't comfortable being in that environment either. And so the disciples are being cornered by the Pharisees, already feeling uncomfortable for the purpose that the Pharisees are hoping that the disciples are going to say something bad against Jesus. What news would that be for them? Oh, even the, their, his own disciples don't like him. Listen to the complaints that the disciples have. And so they're gossiping with the idea that they're hoping that the disciples will gossip back. Justify or try to say, no, 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 no. I don't like the sinners. I'm just following Jesus Christ. But if I had my way, I wouldn't be here at all. That's what they're waiting for. But Jesus intercepts. Notice if you don't mind, and he saves them. Verse 30, but the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering. Now they weren't talking to Jesus, but Jesus comes and intercepts this and said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now this is pretty amazing. That Jesus Christ comes and talks with him, intercepts the gossip, and told him he was come to find those that knew they needed help. Now, the Pharisees were sinners, correct? But did they think they were sinners? Not at all. And so, did they need help? Not if they didn't think they need help. You can only help people who want help. Do you think people who are on sins and drugs and alcohols and addiction, do you think they recognize they need help? Absolutely they do. They need help and they know it. Do the tax collectors know that everyone hates them? Yes. Do they know that they need something? Yes. So Jesus is coming to those who need help, who are looking for help, who know that they need something different. Jesus said, I'm tried with you guys. You guys are just trying to find ways to ruin me. I'm going to the people who want the help, the people who want the encouragement, people who want the change of life. Those are the people I'm going to. If you are not sick, you don't need a doctor. But if you are sick, you need a doctor. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to help those that are sick. Now again, Jesus is having the heart. But the whole outskirt of this, the Pharisees are trying to find some way to criticize Jesus. Now, pause. When Jesus sees the Pharisees gossiping with the disciples, does he know what's going on? Yes. Yes. How would you feel if you saw a corner, a bunch of people in the corner talking about you and trying to get your friends to break down and complain about you? How would you respond? How would you react? Would you be happy about it? I meant... They're trying to look for some way to provoke Jesus. 
How does he respond? Notice as we go on. We see that Jesus came to heal the sick. But notice this. Jesus' coming was for celebration. Jesus' coming was for celebration. So the Pharisees say, all right, since we have you in a conversation, Jesus, let's ask another question. Notice with me in verse number 33. And they, the Pharisees, said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine, those disciples, your disciples, eat and drink. So, here we have, they're doing a comparison, and the closest group to Jesus' disciples would be the followers of John. Now, the followers of John, because as they followed John, they uh, were trying to go to repentance, but John had taught them that they needed to fast and to pray. Now, is fasting and prayer wrong? No. So they come and ask the question. John's group, they fast. Our group, we fast because we're religious. We're really good at fasting. We're expert faster. You know, we, we teach courses on how to fast. and uh, So, you know, there's... They're very braggadocious about their fasting. They would go off into the neighborhoods and say, Guess how long I have fasted? I have fasted faithfully this week. I have fasted two or three times last week. The week before that, four times. I am an expert faster. Everyone see how great of a faster I am. I'm not a feaster, I'm a faster. And so, <laughs> they would brag about it. This was a big deal to them. But they've noticed that Jesus' disciples, they didn't brag about fasting. They weren't fasting at all. John's disciples fasting. Now, they weren't fasting like the Pharisees, but they would fast and pray because they were looking for the Messiah. That's what they were taught to do. The Pharisees were fasting because it made them look super religious. So they come to Jesus. Why don't your boys disciple? They just they are fast. Your disciples don't fast. They fast. They fast. How come you guys don't fast? What not? Notice with me in verse 34. And he, Jesus, said to them, the Pharisees, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now, we understand as we're fixing to enter into a new territory talking about the bride of Christ. Now let's imagine a wedding day. A beautiful wedding day. The church is decorated up. You have uh, everyone prepared. And you have the uh, bride. They come down and they, they say, I do you, do you, do you. And they do. And they go out there. And they get ready to do the cake. And the, and the bride says, no, 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 no. I'm fasting. They had this big spread set out for them. No, 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 no. I'm fasting. I'm, I'm praying. I'm waiting for my beloved to join with me. He's right there. You know, she's going to partake in the feast and partake in the wedding cake because the one she's been waiting for is right there. She just got married. Why does she have any reason to fast? Listen, if you don't have any need of the greatest burden in your life. If it's that prayer has already been answered. Do you fast and pray to get the receive the answered prayer when you already have it? No. Jesus says the thing that they're looking for is here. I'm here. Jesus is here. That's what we're looking for. However, verse 20, 35. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then they shall fast in those days. And we know that Jesus Christ is going to be taken. He's going to be crucified on a cross. He's going to be buried on a borrowed tomb. He's going to rise again the third day. Spend 40 days with his disciples. And then he's going to ascend up to heaven. And what we're waiting for now is for him to come back. We're not with our bridegroom. We're looking for the day when Jesus Christ comes back. Now, when he comes back, are we going to fast? No, because that's the whole reason what we're looking for. We're looking for Jesus. So Jesus says they don't have any reason to fast because what they're looking for is already with them. They'll fast later on. But for now, there's no reason to fast. They're in celebration. We're looking for, <laughs> thankful for that. So those dirty dogs are not done yet. 
So Jesus begins to teach them something else. And we see a third thing here. That Christ coming was for something brand new. Christ coming was something for brand new. Now remember the Pharisees have kind of cornered Judaism. And that they have their own brand of religion. And that they're the heads of it. They have made the Jew, uh, Jewish religion so complicated and so awful that no one could live up to the perfection. And so the Pharisees are the top dogs of the chain think that they're better than everyone else. And that's, by the way, why they're looking for something to criticize Jesus with. Because if they could find something to knock Jesus off, then they're the top dogs again. Jesus continues to teach them, knowing their heart, might as well, since they're already trying to find ways to criticize me. Let's make this clear. Notice in verse 36. And he, Jesus, spake also a parable unto them. Who's that? Them, the Pharisees. He's speaking directly to the Pharisees. No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agree with not the old. All right, so let's, um, let's put this into practice. I'm wearing an older suit. My wife's going to say, please don't. Um, I'm wearing a vest, but in my vest, this is old. It's all torn up, and it's kind of threadbare, and it's barely holding together. It's just because I just keep getting bigger and bigger. And <laughs> but it's, it's all threadbare. And so as you can see the threads, and say, so you know what? I love this vest. And so, honey, let's save this. And so let's take some new cloth, and let's see if we could just kind of patch the holes. Is that how it works? What's going to happen is that the new cloth is going to be strong while the other cloth around it is weak and it's just going to tear even more that garment. It's not going to work. That's not how you patch it is you don't take a brand new cloth and try to put it on top of an old and try to piece it together. It's just going to tear. Besides, there would be an obvious patch that you could say, hey, that doesn't belong. It looks different. It doesn't match. It doesn't work out well. It doesn't fit right. You have this nice square that's nice and around it's all jagged. It, it's going to make it worse. Correct? He goes on and gives another illustration. Verse number 20, 37. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Else new wine will burst from the bottles and be spilt. And the bottles shall perish. Now, here's another thing we have to define our terms. We understand bottles. When you think of bottles, you're probably thinking of some glass bottle. Back in those days, what they were talking about bottles, they would usually put wine, grape juice, that type of thing, inside of a hide, some type of skin. I have the correct one, goat skin. And so they would use a goat skin. And after time, the goat skin would dry out and begin to crack, and it would start to, um, to get old with that wine. So what happens is if you would put new grape juice, new wine into it, Unto an old skin because it's already worn out. That new wine when you first put it in will start to expand. As it begins to settle and begins to change after time. And that goat skin because it's already torn and cracked. It will burst open and everything will spill out. It, you, that's why there was this saying here. That you cannot put a new wine into an old skin. It just doesn't work. Uh, especially an old goat skin that's already torn. Again, both of those have the same idea. That you can't put something new to put a patch job or to save or to recycle the old. It doesn't work. If you're going to have something new, have something new. You can't do the mix and match. Now, what he's trying to get across to the Pharisees here is understanding that the Pharisees have an old way of doing it. They have cornered old Judaism and they have wrecked it and they've made it so it's threadbare, so it's worn out, it's cracked, it's barely functioning. They're just holding on to it just because this is my favorite suit. Why am I still wearing this suit, by the way, even though it's... Because it's my favorite suit. It's something I, I should probably do something else with it, but I'm still wearing it because it's my favorite suit. I like how it looks, but it's old and it's ready to be torn and it shouldn't be worn much longer. Does that make sense? 
So I'm keeping it. That's what, by the way, verse 39. No man having drunk old wine straightway desireth new. For he said the old is better. I like my old suit. So I'm going to continue to wear it as long as I can. And I know that I probably should get new. But this is my, we get that mindset. The Pharisees say, I like my old religion. I like the way that it feels. And yeah, we've kind of abused it and worn it out and made it so, you know, no one else could use it, but we could use it quite well and we like it. And Jesus said, I didn't come to patch up your old broken down system. I came to give something brand new. That instead of working your way to heaven, you just get to trust me by grace. That's much better. And now again, he's talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees don't want to get rid of their old garment. They like it. But it's not functional anymore. There's issues with it. They've destroyed it. They've kind of ruined it. Jesus said, I didn't come to fix the old. I came to give something brand new. But I know you guys, you don't want to get rid of the old. So I'm going to go to someone else who wants the new. Does that make sense? Now again, that all this time, the Pharisees are criticizing. They're looking for something to do. We're watching the response of Jesus and all throughout the gospel record of Luke, you'll see this. So what do we learn from the idea of criticizing? When we're criticized, don't take it personally. Take those criticisms and bring them to the Lord because we're on the Lord's side. Let God take care of it. We need to point people to God. That's our thing. We know that we're going to get criticized. If you don't want to be criticized, do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. But as long as you try to do something from the Lord, there's always going to be someone that criticizes. Absolutely always. Know it's going to happen. Jesus understood that they were going to follow. They were looking for reasons to criticize him. He knew it was going to happen. And he said, I'm not going to take it personally. I understand where they're at. They like their old garment. I'm going to go find someone who needs help. I'm going to find someone who's looking for help. I'm going to go find someone who wants to hear the truth. I'm going to spend my time with those people and spend less time than the people who are criticizing everything that I do. Again, you are going to get criticized. Guarantee, mark it down. Why do you have to keep going to church? I think you're going to church way too often. That happens. I don't understand why you have to keep reading the Bible. Can't you do something else? What? You have to go to church all the time? Or what? You're not going to go to heaven? There's going to be all kinds of things that come up there. Oh, you're too good. You can't go to my favorite concert because you're just too good for us. What? You think that you're better than me just because you go? It's going to happen. Don't take it personally. I mean, they... Criticized Jesus, they followed him around all the time to find something. We need to not take it personally, roll it over to the Lord, understand where they are, and determine I'm going to go find people who want my help, and I'm going to spend time with them. This is just a practical help to all of us. On Sunday night, we know that this is the crowd that loves the Lord. You're trying to do what's right. You love the church. You want to do what's right. Understand you're going to get criticized don't let the criticism that occurs distract you from doing what's right. It's going to come. If you know it's going to come, you can prepare for it. It's going to come. Keep moving forward. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know.
we would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.